Hello. Well, I'm uh, David Johnson, um, and thank you for joining us for this uh, Teach with TVW connection. Uh, we're uh, connected with students um, across the state, and we're uh, connecting with uh, Washington Secretary of State um, Kim Wyman. Um, thank you for joining us, uh, Secretary Wyman. Uh, I wonder if we could just start out with if giving us a brief overview of, of what your office does. Uh, and then give us an update on the work you're doing right now at this time. Absolutely. Well, uh, welcome from uh, Olympia, Washington. I am here in the Capitol and we are working because my job as Secretary of State is to sign proclamations and orders that the governor may issue. And uh, we have to sign them and be, on, be available in, in this COVID-19 response. I can tell you the governor is making a lot of proclamations and we're very busy over here. But um, let me just start by explaining what the responsibilities of the Secretary of State's office are and the work that we do here. Um, I have responsibilities for about four real key parts of Washington state government. Uh, the first is probably the most high profile part and that is elections. So I'm the chief election officer for the state of Washington and I work with 39 county auditors and election officials from across the state to actually conduct the elections. They count the ballots issue the ballots and, and do all of that work. But we set the rules and work with them to make sure that they comply with all of the requirements in state law and constitution uh, to make sure our elections are fair and accurate and accessible. Um, secondly, uh, our office is responsible for charities and corporation filings. So every for-profit or nonprofit corporation in the state of Washington has to register with my office so that people like you can get information about them. And those businesses and nonprofits can actually function and, and uh, uh, do their work. Um, the third area is our state's history. And we have two parts of my office that do that. The first is the state archives and the state library. And those two um, divisions really have the history of our state going back to the territorial days. Uh, and uh, we have some pre-territorial documents and publications that are in, in our collections. And I wanna get these on your radar, uh, students out there, as you do research papers, I can tell you that if you have anything that you need information on Washington authors or Washington stories or, or organizations, it's probably in one of those two places. And um, you can ask a librarian by chat uh, to give you information and I'll let you in on a little secret. They'll do the research for you. Anyway, your teachers would be very proud. Um, and then uh, those are the four main parts of the office. And then we also have some smaller parts that are special programs like our Legacy Washington program, which you can get a lot of information about Washington history and people who have made uh, remarkable things worldwide and here in our state. Uh, we also have the Address Confidentiality Program. And this is a program for people who have been uh, survivors of domestic violence and stalking. And we protect their addresses so that people, their, you know, the perpetrators can't find them. And what we do is we provide them a post office box number that they can use on all of their correspondence, like their phone bill, their electric bill, uh, different things that they need to have mailed to their household. And that gets mailed to us and then we distribute that to our members. And um, th those participants are across the state. We have over 4,000 participants in this program and half of them are minor children. So um, in fact, that's one of the essential functions my office is uh, taking care of right now as we speak. Uh, we have people coming in and processing that mail. Um, in answer to the second part of your question, we are uh, right now doing everything we can to deal with the COVID-19 response. Uh, predominantly, I think front and center are our elections. And uh, we have a very small statewide election in 10 counties that are uh, doing levy and bond races or uh, measures on the ballots. And that is happening uh, on April 28th. And uh, this is a challenge because we have election workers that have to come into county courthouses and provide in-person service as well as process the ballots going out to voters and coming back in to be counted. Uh, so we are trying to um, 
mitigate COVID-19 social distancing and keeping people six feet apart and doing all of, all of those things to keep our voters and our, our workers healthy. It's a challenge and uh, luckily it's a small election so the counties have figured out how to mitigate it as best they can. My biggest worry right now I can share with you is that if one person in one of my smaller counties gets exposed to the virus or gets the virus, that will shut down their county operations for two weeks or more. And uh, this is why the county election officers across the state joined me in asking the governor to cancel our election. Uh, that did not happen. So now we're going to just do the best we can. Um, and then really where we're spending a lot of our time is working towards the August and the November general election. As you all are aware, this is a very big election and a lot of um, people across the country want to vote and want to participate. And I am, I can tell you that my election director, Lori Agino and I have been talking to all 50 states and Puerto Rico to give them ideas of how they could um, expand absentee voting or vote by mail voting in their states and uh, this is going to be a very uh, heavy lift for all of us and we're all working together and the county auditors here in washington state are already planning on how they're going to do the elections in august and in november so um, this is taking up all of our time and it's a it's a great investment of our time and we're really happy to do the work so i that, that's a good long question answer for you <laughs> um yeah your answer uh uh, your, your last answer that kind of feeds into one of the questions we have from Nacelle uh, Grays River Valley School. Um, the student is Theron Frame uh, and asking, uh, how do you think COVID, uh, the COVID-19 outbreak will affect the 2020 presidential election? Um, we've seen uh, in the news some, you know, talk about proposals for going all, you know, mail-in uh, kind, of, kind of elections. Would you mind talking? Can you talk some more about that on some of the discussions you're perhaps having with other secretaries of states about that? I can. It, it's an interesting way that we do elections in this country because while we have every four years a national election for president, it's not a national election in the sense that maybe other countries do their national elections. We have 50 states and our territories that individually run elections that include the presidential race on it. And then I know all of the students watching are well aware that we don't directly elect the president. Um, what happens is states conduct their primary elections and general elections. Then in November, uh, all of those are certified. And in December, on the same date, and I want to say it's December 12th, but I'm making that up, so don't quote me on that date. Um, across the country, in, in capitals across the country, we convene the Electoral College. And what that means is that the electors who are, are um, appointed by the political parties, so the Democratic Party has 12 electors in our state, the Republican Party has 12 electors that they nominate through their own process, and on the, uh, the 20th or the 12th of December, they will come to the Capitol, and whichever, can't, whichever side won uh, will appoint those electors, they will meet and vote. And this is a very old fashioned kind of process, but it actually happens. And um, those 12 electors vote. And then my office sends those results to Congress. And when the Congress convenes in January, uh, the first act that they do is they combine all of, all of those electoral votes and officially uh, make the, the nomination of the president real. And um, then the president, of course, they convene on the 3rd of uh, January. The president is actually inaugurated on the 20th of January. So that's kind of the framework of how it works. But in, in each of those 50 states, we all have different ways of conducting elections. So some states um, on the West Coast, most states are really more vote by mail or absentee ballot leaning. Um, Washington, Oregon, Utah, Colorado, and Hawaii are completely vote by mail states. And so every voter that's eligible in those states gets to have a ballot sent to them for every election they're eligible to participate. Now, a lot of other Western states have very high absentee ballots. So these absentee ballots are people that are saying, I want to vote at home. And um, California, for example, about 60% of their voters or more get an absentee ballot every election. 
California, I think by the November election, you're going to see cut over to completely to vote by mail. Um, and that kind of varies as you move east. When you get to the middle of the country and particularly get to the east coast, however, many of those states have very restrictive absentee laws. If you can believe this, in 2020, we have states where you have to write a note to the county election office with an excuse, and they only accept certain excuses. So you have to be sick on election day. You have to be out of the state on election day. It's really like getting a note from your mom or your doctor um, to be able to vote. And as, as, as antiquated as that sounds, it's a, a practice and they're not all Republican states or all Democrat states. These are blue and red states in, in a whole lot of different um, parts of the East Coast and the, in the Midwest. And so those states are really built for an in-person voting experience. They are states that have polling places open on election day. And now that's going to be very, very, very difficult to keep the workers protected, keep the voters protected. So um, I can tell you that in the last month, I have been on no less than probably 100 either conference calls or video chats like this with my colleagues across the country, and we are all trying to solve the same problems. Um, and the, the states that have less absentee voters that normally participate are going to have the hardest time transferring over to vote by mail. And I, don't, I actually don't think that all the states could do it even if they started right now to get ready for November. Um, but we're all working towards that end. And um, I just actually co-wrote an op-ed with the Arizona Secretary of State, Katie Hobbs, who's a Democrat. And um, she, her state is closer to vote by mail than it is um, polling place. And uh, she and I basically asked Congress uh, for more money. Um, Congress just allocated $400 million to us, to the states, to help mitigate COVID-19. Um, we said that's a very lovely down payment, and it is, and we appreciate it. However, we're going to need somewhere between $1.2 and two, well, I've heard as high as $4 billion. $1.2 to $4 billion to get states to be able to ramp up, to be able to make sure everyone can vote. But um, Whatever happens in all that, what I can tell you, and I've been doing elections for about 27 years, um, people li are like me in the commitment to make sure our election happens. There's a lot of chatter starting on social media that somebody's going to try to cancel this election or postpone it or whatever. The, um, it, it's not an option. Uh, the Constitution says that the president's term ends on new, at noon on the 20th of January. Congress members' terms end on the 3rd of January at noon. That's a hard stop, it's a constitutional requirement, so we have to do whatever it takes to get the elections held so that can happen. Okay, another long answer, sorry. <laughs> okay, thanks. So we have a number of students on the live connection uh, as well. Um, I'd like to go to uh, Annie from Open Window School uh, in Bellevue. Okay. Anyway. Can you hear? I can. Okay. Hi, Secretary Wyman. My name is Annie Krausen, and I am an eighth grader at Open Window School in Bellevue. And my question is, as the Secretary of State, you have many important jobs and a lot to juggle. And how do you prioritize different needs of the state at a time like this? And what have you specifically wor been working on during this crisis? Oh, that is a great question. Thank you, Annie. Um, Wow, that is all I've been doing for the last uh, month and a half is answering exactly that question. Um, we, let me give you context of what my world has been for the last, uh, the last six weeks or so. On January, or excuse me, on February 28th or so, um, we started worrying about COVID, how it was going to impact the presidential primary at that time, and what happens if we had to go into a lockdown. Um, so I, my office has about 300 employees across 27 locations across Washington. And we had to figure out and start figuring out back then how we were going to move all of those employees to remote working. And uh, just as all of you have had to do and try to figure out how you're going to do school and go to class and do all of the studying you need to do over, you know, essentially over the internet or, you know, old fashioned books and paper that your teachers give you to take home. Um, we've been doing the same types of things here in the office. And the first thing that we had to do is look at all of the things that we perform in our day-to-day -day duties and figure out which ones are essential. 
And that, that's kind of a legal definition in some ways, because um, as you see now that we are in the stay at home, stay healthy order, and all of us are having to, to be at home, uh, it really comes down to is the job that you do something that's essential for the health and the safety of the state. Um, and in our case, we, we need to con continue to conduct elections. So I talked a lot about that. Um, but we also, in my corporations and charities division, we have businesses and nonprofits every day that need to file their business paperwork and, and become a, a registered charity, for example, in our state. And you would think on, on some ways we would just be able to just hold those for a while and do them when all of this passes. The problem is those businesses and those charities need money now. And many of them are applying for loans. They're, they're going to their banks or their credit unions to get small business loans or nonprofits are, are doing very similar things. And they have to prove to the bank that they exist and that they have a business license in our state, that they're an active uh, registered owner or registered business. And so we can't stop doing that processing. So um, we're doing things like, how do we continue that business? And luckily we've really tried in the last couple of years to modernize our, our, our offers, our office and our operations. So um, in the elections and corporations area in particular, we now have um, technology that allows our customers to do most things online. Um, not elections, not voting, but a lot of the the day-to-day the -day stuff. So it's, it's a tough thing, but we started early and I think it put us in a good position to be able to continue to do our businesses. So of my 300 employees or so, um, 90, I would say 99% of them are working from home right now and right now the only service we've stopped providing is in-person customer service so I'm really proud of that my my staff and my crew has worked really hard to make sure that we're taking care of you and I think to finalize my long answer uh, to your question is we're always looking at what we believe the citizens and the the residents of this state are looking for and what they want. And that's what drives our decision making is how do we serve you? Because at the end of the day, um, I always ask fourth graders when they come to my office, who's my boss? Who do I report to? And uh, you know, they'll say the governor, lieutenant governor, the legislature. And the answer to the question is the people. And I know you all know that watching because I know you're all very good at civics, but uh, you know, ultimately you're my boss. So, um, so that's kind of how we approach work here is, is how do we best serve the, the people of Washington State? Great. Um, so we have another question uh, from a student on a live connection. Uh, we're, we'll go to Lowell from uh, Meridian uh, High School. Um, hi. Um, so uh, I'm Lowell Thorner from Meridian High School in Bellingham. I'm a senior. And I was going to ask, um, do you think that Washington State will gain a representative, like a federal representative in the census, the 2020 census? Well, thank you, Lowell. And, and good to see you up in Bellingham. Uh, I don't think we're going to get one this time. Um, we have picked up a, a, another seat in Congress in uh, every 20 years seems to be the interval for Washington. So um, you're going to make me do the math. We did it in 2000 and uh, we did it in 1980. So the eight, the, we added the ninth congressional district in, am I doing this right? Yeah. Wait. I'm, I'm missing one in there, aren't I? Excuse me, in 2000 and in, uh, and in 1990 uh, census. So we, we gained the ninth congressional district in 1990 census, and we gained the 10th congressional district in 2000. But the trends that we're seeing in the analysis my staff has been doing on um, population growth, I don't think so. Washington won't lose a seat either, I don't think. I think we're gonna just stay right at 10. Great. So we have some students that have uh, pre-recorded questions as well. We'll go to one. Uh, this is a student from Lake Washington High School. Okay. Hello, my name is Maxwell Bennett and I'm a senior at Lake Washington High School in Kirkland. My question concerns online voting. For the elections this November, if it still isn't safe to be in large crowds, how feasible is 100% online voting? How will communities with limited internet access still be able to participate? In addition, how reliable or secure is online voting when compared to a handwritten ballot? Well, thank you. That is a great question. I appreciate it. Um, this is a discussion that we've been having for decades. And, uh, and unfortunately, my, my, my answer doesn't change just now that we're under this, this crisis. Um, online voting, as we sit here right now on April 3rd, April 3rd? April 3rd, 2020. Um, 
is insecure. I mean, we have companies that, that say they can do it and there's a lot of, of talk out there about it. But at the end of the day, as I think probably every one of you sitting there knows, the internet is not a safe way to transmit data. And we can't guarantee that an email attachment doesn't get hacked or changed, let alone someone's ballot. And um, while billions of dollars go over the internet every day with bank transactions, a bank transaction, you can you can make the person whole. So if, uh, if you buy something from Amazon and something goes goes wrong in that transaction, you can work with Amazon to, to get it fixed. Or your bank, if, you're, if your debit card or credit card gets hacked, you can have that um, be fixed by your bank because they can take a loss in fraud. Um, we can't do that with your vote. And um, to be able to maintain your voter secrecy and protect that, uh, that transaction, there's a point where we take off your name from a, even an absentee ballot so you have a secret ballot. When you do that in an, in an electronic environment, once I do that, if we determine that your ballot was hacked, there's no way to go back and correct it because your ballot's already in the ballot box, so, so to speak. Um, and then the, the, the other reason that I think is even a bigger challenge, even if we could solve all of those today, the bigger challenge is how do I make all of you believe that those results were legitimate? Right now, we have a paper-based system that um, every voter is, is returning a paper ballot and county election officials keep those ballots, they audit them, they, they do recounts, they do a lot of things to instill confidence. And you know, we can ultimately write, you know, if this were a ballot, we, we could look at this ballot and we could argue what was on it and we might not see the same vote, but there's something about tangibly handling a ballot. If you put it in an electronic world, now we're all arguing about code. And so it's really hard for me to instill confidence in people um, with computer code that most people don't understand. So I don't think it's a viable option for this election cycle, especially when you're already getting people casting doubt on our system. Um, I've heard candidates, I've heard office holders who have already started to say that, you know, vote by mail is fraught with fraud and poll site voting is going to suppress people and on and on. So it's already started and we have to do things as election officials to instill your confidence that our election was fair and accurate and secure. So um, we're going to, we're going to keep working to that end, but I don't think online voting is going to happen anytime soon. All right. We'll go to uh, Evangeline at uh, Open Window School. Okay. So, uh, hi, uh, my name is Evangeline Ho and I'm an eighth grader at Open Window School in Bellevue. And my question is, um, so there are many states that are running out of like ventilators and medical supplies and like nurses and doctors. So how is Washington state's medical su system keeping up with the virus? Like, uh, like the medical staff, the supplies, and how are nurses and doctors doing? Ah, great question. Thank you. And I, I can tell you that I am, uh, I'm not in charge of all that, but definitely very close to it. Um, so the first thing that I'll take you back about three, four weeks ago, maybe even as much as six weeks ago, the governor, you know, when he declared a state of emergency, what happens when that, when he does that is it makes our emergency operations center, which is a state run organization of a whole bunch of different entities, people started getting together and started trying to figure out how we were going to mitigate this growing virus that they had already seen happen in China and, you know, Italy and some of countries that were ahead of us, you know, how do we make that so we don't lose a lot of people's lives that are exposed to it. And then of course you're all aware that the Kirkland nursing home really put Washington front and center in that uh, outbreak here in the United States. So um, when Governor Inslee started doing that emergency order, um, the Washington National Guard and our emergency operations center started working immediately. And the first thing they started working on was trying to get as many of those supplies as possible. And you've probably heard from news reports that that's the problem. We have a shortage of masks worldwide, but definitely here in Washington. We have a shortage of test kits. We have a shortage of just capacity to process those tests. Um, and so the Emergency Operations Center actually works to prioritize getting those, those supplies and equipment to hospitals and to any kind of healthcare pro providers so that they can have that protection. And um, it's a daily effort and they're working hard with private industry to create more ventilators um, and just get those supplies out as quickly as possible. And I can tell you that's another discussion we're having in the elections community. You know, how 
if we run an election and we need to have masks for our employees, we're taking away masks for healthcare workers. And, you know, which is more important? I, I think people's lives probably is a little bit more important than running an election right now. So those are the kind of decisions that are being made. But I assure you that they're working very hard with federal partners and really trying to exhaust every place where they can get um, those needed supplies. And I can tell you that uh, corporations around the world are also trying to spool up things. I, I think all of the major manufacturers of automobiles, for example, from Ford to Ferrari, are working to uh, produce ventilators. So it's, uh, I think it's bringing people together in a really positive way to try to solve this crisis. And we're working really hard and it's scary. And we have some really good people with really good skill sets that are trying to make sure that we're all safe. So great question, thank you. All right, we have another question, a pre-recorded question from uh, Lake Washington High School. Hi, my name is Sarah Freeman and I'm a senior at Lake Washington High School in Kirkland. My question has to do with the 2020 presidential election. Do you think that there will be significant change in voter turnout in Washington state due to the coronavirus outbreak? Oh boy, that, thank you. That is a great question too. Um, the same kind of same remarks I made earlier apply here. Um, what our, what we're trying to do as county election officials right now is anticipate all of the variables that might keep people from voting or being able to participate, including registering to vote. I mean, you know, many of you might be uh, soon to be 18 year olds and, and be able to vote in this election this fall. We're doing everything we can to make sure that um, there aren't barriers in place, even with COVID-19. Um, so I think you're going to see a lot of aggressive messaging of reminding people right now, check and see if you're registered to vote. Check and make sure your address is current and get all of that information well in advance to, uh, to election officials before the, the general uh, primary election and general election. And then giving some options to voters of how they can return their ballots without having to go into a county courthouse. And if you need to get a ballot, you know, it would be much better if we could just mail you one. Um, so we're going to do a, a lot of messaging from my office and from the 39 county auditors to get um, give voters options so that they can engage and can participate. Um, the nice thing about vote by mail is we have 18 days for you as a voter to be able to get your ballot in. And we're going to really remind people of that window and encourage them to use it and try to do everything from home. With all of that said, um, that is one of my biggest concerns is that we're going to see a drop in participation. Um, but I think what works to our favor in this election cycle is this election is so high profile. It is front and center in everyone's minds and people are very passionate on every side of this, uh, of the political spectrum um, from the, the most, you know, liberal, uh, the liberal Democrats, the most conservative Republicans and everyone in between on that spectrum, people want to participate. So that's going to work to our favor. People are going to want to engage and we're going to help them do that. And I'm hoping that we actually see our highest turnout ever in our state. That's our goal. All right, great. We have another question from an uh, open window uh, student, uh, Cadence. Yeah, so um, my name is Cadence and I'm also an eighth grader um, at Open Window. And um, my question was, um, given the current situation, um, a lot of people who have less means to go shopping are often left behind. And how is our state addressing the needs of those people? Um, uh, thank you. That's a, that's a great question, too. Um, again, I think this goes to the whole emergency operations planning that the governor has been working towards and working with legislators and, and communities across our state. Um, I know that Governor Inslee has signed a number of proclamations to try to get as much financial relief to people as possible. So uh, people that have been laid off, you know, like my son, my, my son got laid off this week and is now uh, out of a job. Um, and, you know, how do you get get people um, those funds that uh, that they need them. And then, of course, we have a whole swath of people that maybe weren't employed anyway or, or don't have access to those funds. Um, I, I think that that the governor's um, agencies like Department of Social and Health Services um, to Employment Security, uh, those, those agencies are really working hard to try to make sure that no one falls through the cracks and that those people have um, have something provided. And then I know uh, there's a lot of nonprofits and charity organizations that are working exactly to that end as well. So I think this is also where the power of the internet starts to come into play because even though we're all home and working from home and, and doing the things that we're doing to try to be safe, um, we're connected in a way 
that I don't think we've ever been in, in the history of mankind, quite honestly, with social media and um, you know, just the fact that we're all having this meeting right now is powerful. Five years from ago, we couldn't have done this. And so I think with that same power comes people that want to do something and they can't. And so I think that nonprofits are going to have a lot of opportunities to reach out to communities, to find those people that you're talking about and make sure that they don't uh, go hungry, that they have heat in their homes, that they have lights on. On, um, and that they can at least take care of themselves and, and all that. But, um, but there's no perfect answer and we're, we're, we're all doing the best we can, I think. And I think this is where we're gonna see the best in people. And that's, that's what I hope anyway. Thank you. I'd like to go to one more question from a Lake Washington student. Hello, my name is Jen Estes and I'm a senior at Lake Washington High School in Kirkland. Um, my question is, during this pandemic, what information is being kept uh, for our historical records for the state so that future generations have and they can learn about? Thanks. Well, that's, this has been such a great set of questions. Thank you again. Um, as I mentioned, we have the state archives in, in our uh, office. And so all of the work that is done every single day um, in state government, and that includes not only here in Washington state government, you know, the executive and judicial and legislative branches, but also county government and local government like cities and towns and fire districts and school districts and such. All of those organizations do a lot of um, creating paper and creating uh, documents and, and things to document the work that they do. So um, we actually keep a lot of that for a very short period of time. They're called records and it depends on the law of how long we have to keep them. But about 2%, so all of the paper we create, about 2% is historic documents. And those historic documents are what go into our, our state archives. And so um, all of these proclamations I was telling you about that the governor is signing and that we're, we're I'm, a, I'm also signing and we're putting into, uh, essentially into the, you all hear about the record books? That's what they're talking about. Um, so we're, we're gonna be keeping all of these things and documenting them in our state archives. And I can tell you that my state archive staff is looking at all of this activity through that prism of we want to make sure we document the really important things that are happening, things that have historic value, financial um, historic value, or legal financial or historic value. And we're capturing those and keeping those documents in our, our archives. So students from uh, Lake Washington School um, 100 years from now are going to be able to pull that up in some really cool techno technological way and say, wow, look at what they did back in 2000 or in 2020 when they were going through the pandemic, you know, and, and that's exactly why we have the archives. That was a great question. Thank you. Great. Um, we have a question from um, one of our teachers, Corey uh, Paulson uh, at Open Windows uh, School. Hi, Secretary Wyman. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, I was interested in a kind of a, two of the things that you talked about that your office does. One, the charity and corporation filings, and then also the work that you do with victims of domestic violence. Um, we hear a lot on the news uh, right now about increases in domestic violence as people are uh, with the stay home, stay healthy order. Are you seeing a lot of increases in um, applications for charity work or um, your work with uh, victims of domestic violence? Uh, what we're, we're seeing, thank you for the question. Um, what we're seeing right now is, you know, like I said, mainly we're trying to serve our current um, participants in the program, but we are, we are staying open to um, all of the agencies that, you know, the, the, what do I want to say, nonprofits that provide uh, shelter for people who are in a crisis situation or um, may deal with domestic violence um, victims or survivors. And so um, we're communicating with those. We haven't seen an uptick yet, but we definitely have seen data that, that shows that during very pressure-filled events like this one, um, stressful events when people are losing their jobs and worrying about how they're going to stay in their homes, how they're going to put food on the table, how they're going to pay their bills. Um, that's when you do traditionally see an increase in domestic violence because that's one of the ways the stress comes out for some people. And so um, so we're just, that's one of the reasons that we're keeping this essential service um, open and, and trying to protect those uh, survivors. And then in terms of the charities and nonprofits, what we're really seeing is that activity of them making Making sure that all of their required paperwork is in place, that they can get a copy of it to, like I said, get access to funds in many cases. Um, so we're not seeing a lot of uptick yet in, 
in terms of activity of program participants, but I anticipate we will. You're welcome. Uh, so thank you. I don't, I don't want to um, um, impose on your time too much. Uh, do you have you have time for another question? I could take another question. <laughs> right. Exactly. Excellent. Let's go to um, uh, Madeline um, from Open Window School. Hi. Yeah. Can you hear me? I can. Wonderful. So my name is Madeline Goldberger, and I am in eighth grade at Open Window School. And uh, my question is. First responders are extremely critical during this time. They are at the greatest risk and more and more are getting sicker. What is Washington State doing to protect these people and how is Washington State making sure that we are not running out of personal protective equipment for these first responders? Oh, yeah, thank you. That's, that's a great question too. Um, you know, again, this goes to our overall uh, emergency response plans and they are, are being kicked into gear and have been for the last month and a half or so. And um, the question you just asked is the same question every state in this, this country is asking because we're all trying to, uh, to get our hands on that equipment and make sure that our first responders are, um, you know, because they're in, for those of you in Kirkland know firsthand, we had um, the, the um, one facility that had the initial outbreak and all of the first responders that, that went on that, into that facility had to be quarantined for 14 days in that fire station because they were all exposed to COVID-19. COVID and so that awareness is is certainly there for all of our first responders and i think really what they're looking towards too is the um uh, the business community corporations and things to try to change their their um their production facilities to be able to to make masks that are that uh the right, I can't think of it. I just completely forgot the number, but I know you all are saying it probably to your computers right now, the N95 or whatever, um, masks they are they are trying to make sure that they have the face shields in fact i've, I've read a couple articles where you know uh, companies are retooling their their um their design uh, what do i say their production facilities to do uh the shields and to do um all of the protective gear if they can make uh gloves if they can do any of that trying to gear those up and so i think uh right now we're all just scrambling to find them and uh, i did hear a great story that the fbi i think is going in and raiding some people across the country who are hoarding some of this these materials and supplies either to sell them at some exorbitant price online or whatever and uh, they're going in and confiscating those those materials and getting them to people. But um, I think it, it, there's no perfect answer. I think we're all working together to try to solve it. And uh, we wanna keep everyone safe, but certainly those people who are putting their lives on the line every day, going into hospitals, going into doctor's offices, first responders showing up at your house when, when, uh, when an emergency happens, we have to protect those people too. All right. Well, well. Thank you, uh, Secretary Wyman, for joining us for this uh, our first uh, Teach with TVW uh, connection. This will be posted on uh, Teach with uh, TVW very shortly uh, after we're finished and and a bit pushed out on social media, so made widely available. So thank you for joining us, and thank you all for participating. We really appreciate it. Yes, thank you. And you're, it, what a bright future our state has. You are all wonderful, wonderful, wonderful uh, students. You're smart, keep doing what you're doing. And for those of you who are seniors, I'm sorry your senior year is being impacted the way that it is. Hang in there. But you're going to have stories to tell your grandchildren years from now. That's a great part of this. <laughs> yeah, okay, I don't know how to make a good spin on it. But thank you for all you do. You're, you're great students. You're really bright. And it was an honor to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care. All right. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.